Okay, so the topic of this video is going to be proteins, and then a little bit later, amino acids and enzymes. Let's get started. So what does this phrase, you are what you eat, mean to you? If we're in class, we're going to talk about this. But let's move forward. So when it comes to proteins, they are one of the four categories of organic molecules, the other being lipids and carbohydrates and nucleic acids. Now, proteins are used in a variety of cellular functions. For example, DNA replication. One piece of DNA can copy itself into two pieces of DNA. This requires proteins along the journey. Facilitated diffusion is another example of a cell function requiring proteins. Here's a picture of our cell membrane. Here comes a glucose molecule. And through the protein channel labeled, glucose can be brought into the cell to be used as needed. You know, when it comes to photosynthesis and creating glucose, you know, here's a leaf. They take in water and carbon dioxide and sunlight and will create glucose and oxygen. None of these are proteins, but proteins are used along the way. Same in cellular respiration, the process of making ATP. Here's a mitochondria. The mitochondria will take in glucose and take in oxygen, and through cellular respiration creates ATP and water and carbon dioxide. None of these are proteins, but proteins are used along the way. So let's talk about the basic building block of a protein or a monomer of a protein. That's called an amino acid. Here's an amino acid. They have weird names to them, leucine. Leucine, for example, might bond with this other amino acid called valine, and they bond through what's called a peptide bond. And then here's another amino acid, alanine, bonded together. Here's a, uh, and, and altogether, there's, there's actually 20 different amino acids that exist. Here's another one that's bonded to the chain, and another, and another, and another. And ultimately, you have this chain of amino acids, which goes by the name of a polypeptide. Now, polypeptides are not quite proteins, but they're created by the ribosome. So here's a ribosome. What the ribosome does is it gathers amino acids. Maybe it gathers glycine and then bonds it with leucine and then bonds it with lysine and bonds it with another amino acid and then another amino acid and then another amino acid. So notice we have two polypeptides here, one in orange and one in green. Well, what happens next is proteins are formed from a collection of polypeptides. And so these two polypeptides will intertwine with one another and twist and fold and wrap into what's called a protein. Now, the exact arrangement of amino acids is what determines the protein. So in this case, the orange and the green will intertwine, and when they react, they form this normal proper shaped protein right here. Well, here's the other, here's another of the orange chain and here's another of the green chain. Let's pretend there was a mistake in making the green one. That amino acid at the back is mutated. Now, when these two chains intertwine and twist and fold and wrap, because there's a wrong amino acid, the shape of the protein will be altered and therefore its function and a disorder very well could occur. Sickle cell disease is a great example of a disorder that can result if proteins are not built properly. If you don't have sickle cell disease and your red blood cells are normal, they're round and they roll freely and they travel through your veins and arteries. But if you do have sickle cell disease, like you see in the picture, your red blood cells tend to look like this. And this causes them to clog and they don't carry oxygen well. And this is caused by a misshapen protein by one wrong amino acid in the polypeptide chain. Okay, so let's go over amino acids in a little more detail. Again, what's an amino acid? It's the monomer, the building block of a protein. There are 20 different amino acids that exist. For instance, alanine and valine and lysine and methionine. Now they all have little different qualities to them. For example, these are nonpolar and hydrophobic. In green, these are polar hydrophilic and have a neutral pH. In blue, these have a basic pH. In pink, these have an acidic pH. These qualities will be important in a little bit. Well, if we talk about their structure, they have five basic parts. Now, because these are organic molecules, they're gonna be built around carbon. Attached to the carbon will be what's called an amino group. A nitrogen and two hydrogens is what we call an amino group. 
And then there's a single hydrogen attached to the carbon in the middle. And then there is what's called a carboxyl, a, a, carbon, a carbon and a couple oxygens, then a hydrogen. So you can see what they did. Uh, whoever named this, they took the word carbon and oxygen and kind of just mushed them together. And let's call that a carboxyl. And then there's what's called the R group. Now, this is interesting because when you look on the periodic table and you try to find the, uh, the, the element with an R, it, it doesn't exist. So what is this R group? Well, I said earlier, there's, uh, there's 20 different amino acids. Well, here's three of them serine, glycine, alanine. I don't have space to draw all 20 of them. And notice they all have a central carbon. They all have the amino group. They all have that single hydrogen. They all have that carboxyl group. So they're virtually identical. So far, they are identical. How do they differ from one another? They each have a different R group. Serine's R group or side group is this right here. Alanine's R group or sorry, glycine's, glycine's R group, or its, th or its side group, is this right here. And alanine's R group, or side group, is this right here. So the, the R group isn't an element on the periodic table, it's just the rest of the amino acid. Each of the 20 amino acids has a different R group. So here are three generically drawn amino acids. Notice how there's just the R group on them. Well, my question is, how would these three amino acids, how would they even bond with one another to make a polypeptide? You might know of the chemical process called dehydration synthesis. And so I've highlighted the OHs and Hs in red. And so let's look on the two left amino acids. They're brought together and with the help of something called enzymes, see how there's, a H, there's two Hs and an O. Can you think of a molecule that has two Hs and an O? H2O, water. And in a dehydration synthesis, the H2Os are removed and notice what happened. It, a peptide bond formed, bonding the two amino acids together. Well, let's do that again on the right-hand side. Notice how there's two H's and an O, and then enzymes will play a role, something called enzymes will play a role, and water is removed and then another peptide bond forms. So notice how these three amino acids have now been bonded into one larger polypeptide. Water was removed, hence the reason why it's called a dehydration reaction. So here's a little review challenge for you. Pause the video, I'm gonna go over the answers now. For number one, I hope you said amino acids. Number two, 20. Number three, carboxyl. Number four, R group or side group, number five, amino group, number six, ribosome, number seven, peptide bond, number eight, R group or side group. Let's continue on. So when it comes to digesting proteins, proteins are common to foods such as meats, like steaks and chicken and fish, also common to beans and eggs and nuts. Well, the proteins are swallowed, they go into your stomach, the food is swallowed, it goes into your stomach, and the proteins are then denatured, which means they're broken down. So here's a protein that you just swallowed, and it's uh, in your stomach, and the stomach acids and enzymes in your stomach begin to break down the protein into, for instance, polypeptides. And then the polypeptides will enter the beginning of your small intestine called the duodenum, and once they enter the beginning of your small intestines, uh, chemicals from your gallbladder and chemicals from your pancreas will break them, uh, the polypeptides into their individual amino acids. And so now that the amino acids have been uh, released, they can enter your bloodstream and your heart will transport them through your circulatory system all around your body. Well, if we look at, um, the chemical process that breaks down, for instance, a polypeptide. This is called a hydrolysis reaction. So again, there's the peptide bond. In a hydrolysis, hydro implies water. In this case, enzymes along with water are going to be used to break down one amino acid from the others. Let's do that again. Here comes another water molecule and this peptide bond 
will be broken. And notice how that polypeptide has now been broken into three amino acids. This is what's called a hydrolysis reaction. Let's talk about how proteins take their shape, how they fold. First of all, the final folded shape of a protein is crucial to its function. If the shape of the protein is irregular, the protein will not perform its function as needed and a disorder could happen. And so there's actually four stages of protein folding. The primary structure of a protein, it's just a chain of amino acids linked together by the ribosome into what's called a polypeptide. And there you have the primary structure. The secondary structure, hydrogen bonds will, uh, between the amino groups and the carboxyl groups will cause the polypeptide to fold, like you see right here. This is called the secondary structure. Tertiary, which just means third, the tertiary structure. Remember, each of these amino acids has a different R group, and the R groups will interact with one another because some of them are hydrophobic and hydrophilic, some of them are acids, some of them are bases. And they twist and fold and compress even further. Again, they do this because the R groups have different characteristics. This is that uh, the characteristics I discussed earlier in the video. And then finally, the final shape of the protein, the quaternary structure. Many times, proteins are made from not just one uh, polypeptide chain. Multiple polypeptide chains will be twisted and folded together to make this final protein. Notice this protein was made from three different polypeptides. And so if you look at computer-created models of proteins, they often look like this. Notice how there are different colors representing different chains of polypeptides. So let's talk a little bit about enzymes. First of all, enzymes are a category of proteins, so they're made from folded chains of polypeptides. Now, in general, all enzymes will lower the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. Enzymes are sensitive to their environment meaning they can be denatured and broken down if there's a fluctuation or a change to their natural environment. Normally, for example, our body temperature is around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And if so, our protein might look like you see in the picture. But let's say we have a high fever of, let's say, 104 degrees, maybe even higher. That few degree elevation can cause various proteins and enzymes to denature and break apart. And this is why a high fever can actually have serious, sometimes even fatal effects on the body. Um, so if you have a high fever, enzymes are losing their ability to work, which can stop a, a variety of cell functions, which again, as I say, stated, could, could actually be fatal. Another is alcohol poisoning can lower the pH in our bloodstream and that can denature the proteins that are floating around suspended in the bloodstream. Enzymes are very specific in their actions. Here's a vein with red blood cells rolling through them. Let's pretend you have a meal. You have a hamburger, you have some corn, and you have some french fries. Now, are there actually hamburgers and corn and french fries traveling through your veins? Of course not, but the molecules from your food are broken down, and those molecules are broken down by your enzymes. So for example, there's an enzyme called amylase. Amylase is an enzyme that will break down the starch that's in your food. And so here is a molecule of starch. Notice it's made from many bonded glucose molecules. So amylase is an enzyme that will break down this one single starch molecule into many individual glucoses. And then, and then it's those glucoses that are absorbed into your bloodstream and will transport through our blood to all the cells in your body. But where did those glucoses come from? They came from your hamburger and they came from the corn that you eat and they came from the, uh, the french fries that you had. One thing to mention, enzymes are reusable. So uh, here we have some amylase enzymes that have just broken down a starch molecule. Well, those same amylases can be used to break down another starch and those same amylases can be used to break down yet another one. 
So there you have it, a quick overview of proteins. I hope you found this video helpful. Try this little practice quiz. Thanks for watching.